So in this video, I'm going to go through the poem Sci-Fi by Tracy K. Smith from her collection Life on Mars. Uh, but before I go through the poem, I wanted to start in an unlikely place. Um, this is an article from Cognitive Business News, and it's about China's relationship with the genre of science fiction. So I won't read out the article, but it explains how science fiction was once encouraged by Mao as a way of encouraging technical progress. Um, you know, it was seen as important as a tool to help imagine a modern society. Uh, but that changed when the Cultural Revolution came about, and uh, it was seen as a genre of escapism and therefore useless. Um, but that changed again much later. Um, and the fantasy writer Neil Gaiman, uh, he delivered a speech where he talked about going to China to speak at the first sci-fi convention in China's history. And he asked a government official why they had changed their mind about sci-fi. And the official said that the Chinese were brilliant at making things if other people brought them off the plans, but they did not innovate and they did not invent. They didn't imagine. So now China has uh, really had this renewed support and enthusiasm for sci-fi. Uh, and they've pushed it particularly with children because um, they see it as important in uh, delivering innovation, technological innovation. So I'm going to come back to this, uh, this article uh, later on when I'm talking about the, the um, poem. And the other thing that I wanted to speak about before I get into the poem proper is this uh, movement, retrofuturism. Um, it's an art style uh, where artists imagine the future uh, that's based in earlier technologies. So things like steampunk, um, is an example of retrofuturism, but it's an art style that's really um, influenced by images like these, uh, the one that I've got on the screen at the moment, which is from the early 1900s, and this French artist who was asked to imagine what life would be like in the year 2000. And we can see even though these weren't retro when they were made, uh, they are now, so I suppose now we look at them in, as an example of retrofuturism. But let's have a look at what Christopher Rusin has to say about these images. He says that uh, the world these images show is paradoxically imaginative and limited. Imaginative because it paints a beautiful and ornate image, but limited because it fails to explore how many of the basic assumptions of dress, decoration, gender standards were untouched. And I think that's really exemplified in the image that's on the screen at the moment, um, which is of electric scrubbing. Um, so this artist imagined that in the year 2000, 100 years uh, in the future. Uh, so the idea that it's a woman that is still manning the electric scrubbing machine or that um, it is a, a servant, it's a maid that's doing the work, none of those assumptions have been addressed or, you know, updated or, you know, the artist didn't think that those things would go away. But certainly the technological innovation they believed um, would, uh, would change. So we can see there how gender assumptions or class assumptions stay the same, but the technology advances. Um, here's another example. It looks like some kind of um, speech recording device. Um, here's another one about farming. Again, so we can see these gender, dress kind of assumptions, um, decoration. Um, the hairstyles haven't changed in the barber of the future, um, but the barber has. <clears throat> and there's, again, an architect um, who is building as he is designing. Uh, and the, the buildings in that, in that uh, image don't look particularly futuristic, but in the technology does. So... What I find interesting about retrofuturism is that it leads to a kind of dissonance. Um, when we look at these images, we're looking simultaneously at the past and at the future. So what I think makes us aware, um, or what I think it makes us aware of when we look at those images is that the future doesn't just emerge naturally. Um, the future is actually invented in our imaginations first. Um, it's invented in the world of fiction, and that fictitious world is the thing that then shapes the real one. So that's what the Chinese government realized, right? And um, that they needed science fiction if they actually wanted technological innovation. And I want you to keep this idea in mind as we go through the poem and the rest of Smith's poem. What kind of world is Smith imagining into existence? Uh, and it's really appropriate that Smith oftentimes makes these references to retrofuturist um, pieces of work. Um, 
So that's the reason why I wanted to go through that. But let's start looking at the poem itself. Um, there's a lecture that Smith delivered um, called How I Read a Poem. And she said that one of the questions she asked herself when looking at a poem is what information does the title contain? And what expectation does that title establish? And then how does the first line go about responding to that expectation? So with those questions in mind, let's look at the title and the beginning of the poem. <clears throat> so the title sci-fi is obviously very broad and expansive. It's an entire genre of fiction, um, a type of world with familiar conventions, um, you know, familiar settings, characters, plots, symbols, themes. It's a genre that requires uh, speculation, and usually that speculation about the future, about what is possible or probable, uh, and oftentimes as well, uh, it speculates about our relationship to technology and how that you know, relationship might change us. Um, those sci-fi composers are oftentimes forcing uh, audiences to consider what it means to be human. So in titling her poem sci-fi, we're expecting her to create uh, a science fiction world, which she does. Um, but also the fact that the title is so broad means that we're also expecting her to make some commentary on the genre itself. So after we look at the title, we can look to the opening lines of the poem and how they respond to the expectations the title establishes. So the opening lines, there will be no edges but curves, clean lines pointing only forward. So the poem begins with a declaration. It's a rejection of the past and its edges. Um, think of an edge, uh, it's a limitation is what an edge is. An edge um, is something that you fall off, it's a hazard, it's something you can get snagged on. There will be none of that in sci-fi's promised future. So think here in these opening lines um, of the way that we often envision the future in popular fiction. Uh, it's oftentimes sleek, white, clean, uh, with curved, rounded edges. Um, and Smith is drawing on those kind of retro-futurist images of the space age um, that, are, that are rounded and sleek uh, and, and clean. Smith's lines point only forward like arrows. Um, and I think that's a reference to the future-facing genre of science fiction. Um, there's a belief that's existed for a long time that humanity is always getting smarter, getting more efficient, more humane, more moral, more civilized as we progress through history. And that's an assumption that sci-fi oftentimes reinforces. I mean, you know, why else would, you know, a government like China's uh, use sci-fi as a kind of uh, propaganda tool? But also sci-fi sometimes challenges that idea uh, that we're becoming um, smarter, more efficient, more humane, more moral, and depending on the text. Um, so the idea that Smith is presenting us with is of forward momentum, of future advancement. Um, but we'll see later on in the poem that she does have some reservations about that. Uh, the next stanza continues this image of the future. And so she writes that history with its hard spine and dog-eared corners will be replaced with nuance. So history, the thing that sci-fi seems to cast off, is symbolized here as a book, um, an obsolete piece of technology that's ragged, it's falling apart, it's useless and unsightly. So we're encouraged to think of those stately old histories written by men and enshrined in popular consciousness. So Smith is saying that this kind of history will be replaced with nuance. And you can think of those revisionist histories that poke holes um, in the histories of old, those histories that we've uncritically accepted. The assumption, once again here, is that humanity is moving towards a more enlightened understanding of ourselves and our past. We're becoming more nuanced, more understanding. Um, so yeah, there's that assumption of uh, forward momentum and advancement. So that view of humanity continues with this image in the third stanza, just like the dinosaurs gave way to mounds and mounds of ice. So that, that image, you know, the, the fact that it's ice, the ice age, um, suggests that this is a, a natural progress, that the old is subsumed by time and that new realities assert themselves over the top of old ones. But it's also a confronting image uh, in certain ways, 
because in this future we the reader are part of that age of dinosaurs where the thing that will be subsumed and taken over um it's a vision of the future that assumes that we ourselves are outdated are outmoded or obsolete so it's this juxtaposition of the future and the past uh, and the realization that we are part of the past or will be part of the past that might cause us a kind of dissonance an uncomfortable awareness of ourselves and our limitations. So the next stanza continues to show how in Smith's sci-fi future, those old edges, the binaries, the limitations will be dissembled. Um, though women will still be women, the distinction that is the of biological sex, um, the word that finishes this stanza, will be empty. So a feminist might argue that this is an ideal worth striving towards, gender parity, equal treatment of sexes. Uh, in Smith's future, this is achieved. So once again, humanity is continuing forward towards a more enlightened state of being. And I just mentioned that word sex that finishes the stanza. I think in the context of these two lines of, of this stanza, it seems to speak to that distinction between men and women. Um, you know, biological sex. But I want you to notice the enjambment. Um, so the way that this word is actually the beginning of a sentence that's continued in the next stanza. And in the next stanza, the word actually has a different meaning. So it changes meaning. It says sex, having outlived every threat, will gratify only the mind, which is where it, is, where it will exist. So I would argue uh, that this is the point uh, in the poem, or it, it's the poem's volta, uh, which is spelt V-O-L-T-A. And that's a word that we use in poetry to describe a kind of turn and the place where things shift, usually shift emotionally. And I'd, I, I'd argue that the turn is this, that the beginning of the poem suggests an almost utopian future, but this is the point where the future becomes less utopian and more concerning. And I'll explain in a minute why I believe that. Um, why there's that change. Um, but I just want to point out that the idea of the Volta, the change or the revelation, is actually pretty common in utopian science fiction. So you can probably name a few movies or books uh, where something is initially presented as a utopia, but then it's revealed that there's a dark hidden truth that subverts that initial presentation. Uh, so uh, Lois Lowry's book, The Giver is one I can think of, or um, Le Guin's short story, The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelis. Um, they both present a kind of utopian vision, uh, and then it's subverted with where that utopia is, uh, becomes apparent that it is, an, is a dystopia in some, in some eyes. So the fact that the poem um, is structured around a volta um, is really, it's apt for a poem titled sci-fi, uh, because that is a common uh, structural form in the sci-fi genre. So why do I believe the poem turns? Well, <clears throat> if we look at that representation of sex in the poem, sex is a part of the human experience as a means of reproduction, um, but also as a bodily expression of desire and pleasure. But here in this future, it just seems to be stripped of those purposes it becomes just a mere intellectual activity. So it's an ironically sexless image of sex. If sex is a physical expression of connection, this future suggests a world where that connection is compromised. And then Smith continues the poem with more images of isolation. So then, for kicks, we'll dance for ourselves before mirrors studded with golden bulbs. So again, this is another image where something that is potentially joyful is neutered by Smith. So dancing like sex is, you know, this sort of joyful expression of the body, but it's strangely sterilized. Um, we dance only for ourselves. So isolation is beginning to emerge as a motif in the poem. And Smith's concern that the forward march of time and advances in technology make us more and more isolated, you know, that's a common idea. Uh, that we that we hear a lot, that our technology is making us more and more isolated. So Smith seems to be creatively channeling those contextual anxieties with her imagery here. 
But let's talk a bit about the second half of that image that we dance before mirrors studded with golden bulbs. Um, it's an image that, uh, for me, it, it immediately recalls old Hollywood. Uh, you can picture those mirrors that divas sit in front of um, with the light bulbs studded all around uh, the mirror. So again, it's it's an image that recalls a retro-futurist kind of future. Um, it's a vision of the future, but it has this imagery from the past so it's both of those things simultaneously it's an image that's that feels odd and out of place and i think that that oddness compels us to read the image in a slightly different way um to read it in a way that makes it sit more comfortably in the science fiction genre so i think of the way that people refer to screens that we use um our computers televisions as phones as black mirrors you know particularly when those screens are not active and on um so the science fiction tv show black mirror it takes its name from that idea um and it does so because it's drawing on the idea that we don't just literally see ourselves in the reflection of our technology's dark screens but we're also seeing ourselves our humanity in that technology and considering the greater prevalence of digital technology in our lives Science fiction writers are often provoked to consider how our humanity might be diminished or overwhelmed by that technology. So the image of the mirror and the golden bulbs you could read as like pixels on the screen is transformed into a symbol of man's complicated relationship with technology and the way that it exists as an existential threat to our human identity. Um, it's something that we've seen already begin to explore in her images of isolation. So that possibly dystopian view of humanity is extended in the next two stanzas, where Smith writes about the glow of the artificial lights not being the glow of the sun, but of the sun, S-U-N, standard uranium neutralizing device. So the sun, this image of the natural world, it's, you know, this life-giving, nourishing center of our universe has been rendered obsolete, much like history. And I think Smith intends this as a kind of ironic image like I think she's making a joke that the sun's been replaced um, you know like the beauty of sex or dancing with a pale imitation uh, a shadow of its former self and she uses that kind of sterilized um, scientific ugly language of standard um, uranium neutralizing device um, it's kind of ironically ugly uh, compared to the beauty of the sun the natural sun so suddenly this poem seems very cold and that early image of the dinosaurs covered by mounds and mounds of ice seems less like a promise like it did at the beginning of the poem and more like a threat. So if we look at this stanza and says, and yes, we'll live to be much older thanks to popular consensus, I want us to draw attention to the fact that Smith uses a whole range of different popular culture references throughout all of her poems. Um, you know, most notably uh, David Bowie uh, and Stanley Kubrick's film 2001 A Space Odyssey. And these all kind of make up a postmodern collage that makes her poetry really distinctive. Um, and here in, in this stanza, um, my read is that Smith is making reference to the classic 1970s science fiction film Logan's Run, um, which it, when we look at it now is another piece of retrofuturism. And I'll read you the, the one-sentence description of the film's uh, plot on, from Wikipedia. It says, Logan's Run depicts a utopian future society on the surface revealed as a dystopia where the population and the consumption of resources are maintained in equilibrium by killing everyone who reaches the age of 30. I think I've got an image here of uh, Logan's Run. Um, so uh, just to, to speak on that for a second, you can see in that image that it's even though it's an image that's meant to be a representation of the future, it's very clearly um, 1970s inspired. Like that image is obviously from the 1970s and yet it, it is of the future. So there's a kind of dissonance there that I think Smith finds uh, interesting to unpick. But when I read out that po uh, plot description of Logan's Run, it should have sounded familiar to it because it's that same structure that I was referring to earlier where the utopia turns out to be a dystopia. Um, the promise turns out to be a threat. So it's the same structure that Smith's using for the poem. So it's an apt reference, as I said before. Um, 
in the future Smith is presenting in this poem, people do grow old, but it's only because of popular consensus, as though the right to grow old has become, um, you know, something that has been democratically decided on uh, and not something that you just naturally have a right to. Um, so again, the, there's this um, sterilizing of the, the natural processes or the natural world um, that is uh, appearing throughout the poem. Um, and, you know, it, it's suggesting that, that those aspects that make up the human experience are becoming sterilized. Um, so that cold legalistic language. Um, and then finally, Smith reveals that this vision of humanity is not on Earth, but eons from our own moon. So on a ship where we're weightless adrift in the haze of space, which will be once and for all scrutable and safe. So scrutable, if you're unsure, just means comprehensible, understandable. Um, like mirror or sun or sex, weightless as a word seems to have dual meanings here. Um, a literal one and a symbolic one. So the ship is weightless in the zero gravity of space, but there's also a hollowness to the vision of humanity here. Um, you know, one where the anchor to fundamental human experiences has become untethered and humanity then is unmoored, is also metaphorically adrift as it is uh, literally in the spaceship. But let's just talk about that final description of space as being scrutable and safe. Um, as we'll discover with, with the rest of um, these poems, Smith sees space, the universe, as a space that humans have used to contemplate the mysteries of our existence. So we see this all the time in popular culture, and that's the reason why Smith incorporates a whole heap of sci-fi references, because to her, they are participating in this human project where we imagine the universe as a a world that is inscrutable, that holds secrets beyond our comprehension. So science seeks to answer those mysteries. And an underlying assumption of science is that, you know, the world is fundamentally knowable. Um, and that's where Smith feels less comfortable with science and more comfortable with fiction, because fiction luxuriates and is comfortable in those mysteries. To Smith, the idea of a universe as scrutable and safe is ironically a really discomforting idea. It's sanitized of its beauty, of its mystery. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that here we can link this to Keats's idea of negative capability, of the idea of um, holding on to and seeking comfort in the unknowable nature of the universe. So, in some ways, sci-fi itself is the melding of two kind of incompatible ways of viewing the world. Uh, the, the way of viewing the world is something knowable, ultimately knowable, and ultimately unknowable. And again, that's a dissonance, and Smith has been exploring dissonances all throughout that poem. Um, and when I spoke about the fact that the title sci-fi means that she's making some sort of commentary on the genre, I think that that is one of the things that she's talking about with the genre. So before I finish, I just want to return to something that was referred to earlier uh, in that article on China and science fiction. So this is Neil Gaiman's speech that was later published in The Guardian. He says, when you watch a TV or see a film, you are looking at things happening to other people. Prose fiction is something that you build up from 26 letters and a handful of punctuation marks and you and you alone, using your imagination, create a world and people uh, in it and, and people and look out through their eyes. You get to feel things, visit places and worlds you would never otherwise know. You learn that everyone else out there is a me as well. You're being someone else, and when you return to your own world, you're going to be slightly changed. Empathy is a tool for building people into groups, for allowing us to function as more than self-obsessed individuals. You're also finding out something, as you read, vitally important for making your way in the world, and it's this. The world doesn't have to be like this things can be different. Fiction can show you a different world. It can take you somewhere you've never been. Once you've visited other worlds, like those who ate fairy fruit, you can never be entirely content with the world that you grew up in. Discontent is a good thing. Discontented people can modify and improve their worlds, leave them better, leave them different. And I think that that's a very apt um, 
excerpt from that speech for the Reimagined Worlds elective um, that we're studying this in. We keep encountering this idea uh, from Gaiman or the Chinese government or in retrofuturist art that the world of fiction has a real and tangible relationship with the material world. That fiction is the space in which we imagine alternatives and futures to the world that is. So start thinking about the assumptions that Smith is challenging in the world of her poems. How might her vision of the future in sci-fi leave us with slightly changed views of humanity in the present? So how does she fire our imagination?